I'm Mark Miller of Agoric, speaking today about the handler pattern. And this is a joint work with Peter of Modable. And this is one of several talks that I've given uh, to TC53. Uh, so this one is a narrow talk that's talking about one particular pattern that's at this, that's an example of this synergy between embedded concerns and security concerns and that are exemplified by hardened JavaScript. But I want to just mention that there are some broad talks that explain the overall connection to hardened JavaScript. Uh, and these links are live if you have the actual presentation. Uh, and in particular, I want to emphasize the, what the title of this, of this last broad talk states don't add security, remove insecurity, that the way we get from JavaScript to harden JavaScript is that we remove mechanisms that impede security, and they're pretty much mechanisms that are outside the normal object-oriented programming paradigm anyway. So, and, and it's outside of what best practices would normally use. So the result is that hardened JavaScript still compatibly runs a tremendous amount of existing code that was written just for JavaScript, not with hardened JavaScript in mind, uh, but nevertheless gets the benefits of security. So for this talk, I'll be talking specifically about the handler pattern that, uh, that makes very concrete some of the synergy between these two benefits. So when we talk about object-oriented programming, object-oriented programming was created initially to bring the, these benefits, and it does bring these benefits, uh, abstraction, encapsulation, the separation of the implementation of an object from, from its interface, polymorphism, the ability to substitute multiple, interfa multiple implementations for the same interface, and reuse, the ability to write abstractions so that they're reusable, so we can stop duplicating so much code. The benefits of object capability programming, including hardened JavaScript, include all of those benefits, may, uh, amplify the benefits of abstraction and encapsulation. It makes this boundary between, it makes the abstraction boundaries really hard security boundaries that cannot be subverted by, uh, by one side across to the other. Uh, it makes the encapsulation of objects absolute. And in so doing, it also, once again, primarily by removing mechanism, it also brings these other benefits. Uh, access control, the, the essence of, of object capabilities is that an object reference <laughs> becomes the only means by which an object has the ability to cause effects outside of itself by invoking the public API of other objects it has access to. Natural least authority, virtualizability by virtue of the fact that, that you're interacting with objects only by a, their substitutable APIs, and defensive consistency, the ability to write abstractions that can be defensive against the misbehavior of their clients so that they stay robust even when their clients misbehave. And it doesn't matter whether you're defending against accidental or malicious misbehavior, in the same mechanisms protect against both. So even when security per se is not a concern, the protection against accidental misbehavior makes the system much more robust and resilient against your own programming bugs. Early on, there was a especially strong emphasis by the pioneers of object-oriented programming on reuse. And to focus on reuse, there was this uh, idea of programming by difference. Uh, there's a famous Alan Kay quote, similar things should be made the same or very different. Wonderful, wonderful design um, prescription. 
And it's even more profound than what it says. It's that when you've got similar things, you can factor it into the part that is the same across all of the similar things. And then the, what's remained is the parts that are very different. And then you have, so that's the, re you can think of that as the factoring of refactoring. And then having separated things out that way, you now need to figure out how to put them back together. And all of that is just um, really just a dynamite set of, in of insights. And when done well, should bring us all much better reuse without diminishing the other benefits. However, in trying to figure out how to do that, the early object languages going actually back uh, all the way to Simula and also Smalltalk came up with class inheritance, then self came up with prototype inheritance. Um, so there's all of these various forms of inheritance. I did, I, did, I did some work on a traits library. There's lots of different forms of inheritance that have been tried for different object languages. JavaScript started with prototype inheritance and now supports class inheritance. And the, the good lesson from inheritance is that it demands that you design two abstraction boundaries. One is the, pub, the public abstraction boundary, which, well, which is the boundary between the, client, the provider, the object that's providing some service, the boundary between that and its client. And the other one is what a C++ or a Java programmer or C -sharp, C sharp, I assume, program would call protected, which is the coordination between a base class and its subclasses. So the idea is that in this factoring for programming by difference, the base class represents this open implementation that in which the different methods of the base class call each other, and then the subclasses do selective overriding to to provide just the part that's different um, uh, between the, the, the different extensions of the base class. Now, I show a pill here, which is a, a bitter, the bitter pill that this way of doing, um, this way of doing programming by difference, by inheritance, uh, the public API and the protected API are not well separated. And the confusion between the two leads to what's often called the ping pong control flow pattern as you bounce back and forth between superclass and subclass methods and it can be very confusing. It does succeed at amplifying the benefits of reuse, but it does so at the price of making all of the other benefits harder to attain. So it does it by weakening all of the other benefits. And in the history of TC39, in our um, uh, expansion of JavaScript, uh, we've encountered those pain points. Uh, when we designed promises, there was a big controversy about whether promises, uh, which were already a difficult API to get agreement on, uh, whether they should additionally have various mechanisms to enable them to be subclassed. And there was something called the constructor check that I won't go into details, but feel free to ask me about, that that th was put in there as an extra mechanism specifically to enable promises to be subclassed, to extend the promise abstraction, and that the result of the constructor check prevents a certain kind of protection against reentrancy. It pre prevents user code from protecting, a, a, you know, from enforcing the asynchrony that should be the protection against reentrancy that asynchrony promises. And there was actually much of the motivation for introducing promises in the first place. We lost that security benefit by virtue of this support for subclassing. Hopefully we can get it back, but it's gonna be hard. Uh, worse, species was there um, in arrays to support array subclassing, and it led various engines such as V8 to themselves actually have memory unsafety vulnerabilities. Um, and there have been a variety of these things, uh, memory unsafety vulnerabilities that were uh, introduced by the standard in order to support subclassing. Uh, and 
Um, likewise, with regexp, there's some methods delegate to other overridable methods that prevents the fast path from being as fast as it can in an abstraction that's really speed critical. So the interesting thing about all of these costs is as far as we can tell from all of the code that I've ever seen other than test code, I have never seen production code, subclass, promise, array, or regexp. As far as we can tell, this is flexibility that no one uses, but because the overriding, the things that, these, this, that these, this support has to check for can happen dynamically, uh, you cannot, the engine cannot optimize for the case where nobody used the flexibility, because the flexibility might always be brought into use dynamically at any moment. By contrast, the ultimately extensible API that we introduced into JavaScript clouds was proxy, in which the public API is just the full behavior, the full object behavior, which in JavaScript is actually fairly complicated behavior with um, properties, with property descriptors, with accessors, um, you know, with inheritance. The, all, the, this, full pro, pro, this full public behavior could now be virtualized by creating a proxy in which you provide this handler that takes the that that serves the role that people were looking to the protected abstraction boundary to serve, uh, which is um, the object that's created the proxy. Uh, its public API is the is the object behavior. The public API of the handler. The handler is only seen by the internal proxy mechanism. And the, when somebody does something with the public API, that in turn causes the proxy implementation to trap to the handler, to call a method of the handler. And the handler could have no methods. You can let everything default, or you can override partic provide particular methods. And that's the basis, the, this private interaction between the implementation and the handler you provide is not confused, is not exposed through the public API. It's a completely different abstraction boundary. So more generally, it's that you've got a extensible class of some sort. Um, you, when you create it, you provide the handler that's the extension points that are invoked by the, only by the implementation of the class privately. You provide the other constructor arguments and you get back an instance. An example of that in ECMA 419 is the serial API, where I'm just going to focus on the onreadable. The onreadable, we like to call, we, Agoric, and like to call the, uh, the methods of the handler that, that you can allow, to, that you can, um, that can be omitted, in which case you just have a default behavior, or they can be present, in which case the implementation delegates to them. We call those methods traps. So, um, so the handler could have an unreadable trap such that when you try to read from the serial device, the implementation of the read operation at the appropriate time in its control flow calls the unreadable trap, which can do what it wants, or you can just omit it and let it default. So, you know, there's nothing tremendously profound here. This is just object subclassing. There's no, there's no grand new mechanism. There's no big new invention here. It's just the disciplined use of, 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 of mechanism we already all understand. And the result is that we get, we get this enhanced form of, abuse, of, of reuse. We preserve most of the benefits that we got from object-oriented programming and from OCAP programming. Uh, but we've, we've made one thing Hard. We've made one thing hard when you, even when you engage in extensibility through the handler pattern, which is, is on the question of does the, 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 does the extensible class trust the handler? Or to put it, put it more precisely, is the integrity of the extensible class dependent on the, the correct behavior of the handler? Is it vulnerable to the misbehavior of the handler? 
which puts it even better. And for the proxy, uh, the proxy succeeds at not trusting the handler, at maintaining very, very strong invariance despite any possible handler misbehavior. But that was a very hard thing to engineer. Uh, in general, when you do an extensible class, you have the, all the normal object capability support for writing a class such that the instance is protected against misbehavior by its clients, but it's still very hard to write a class in which the, uh, the implementation of the instance is invulnerable to misbehavior by the handler. So it's often the case that for the handler pattern, programmers will make the other choice. It's reasonable to make the other choice if you document it, which is that the integrity of the, cl the class implementation relies on certain proper behavior by the handler, that if the handler misbehaves, all bets are off on how the class behaves. And when you, when you make that compromise, it's a reasonable compromise as long as you document it. Uh, and I'll let uh, Peter and Patrick tell me whether uh, serial, uh, what side of that uh, serial. Um, I mean, Patrick and I are uh, notorious for, on the surface, at least at first, expecting things we're supposed to be cooperative. Okay, so that expectation, so then, so then if the user code is not cooperative, are there any hard guarantees that the standard maintains with regard to the behavior of the serial instance? That's, that, that are guarantees that, are, that, are, you know, that will be upheld despite arbitrary misbehavior by the handler? That's, uh, that's a good question. I'm not, I'm not sure I can answer that. Okay. I, I think one of the interesting, one of the things that we always look at in terms of um, misbehavior of a, of a handler, a trap, is um, rust. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Superficial, but, but um, you know, sometimes that matters, sometimes it doesn't. Yep. Yep, yeah. Um, another one to obviously look at is, goes back to our concern about things like data races, which is what happens if in the trap uh, other side effects are performed that uh, might interfere with assumptions made in the extensible class. Okay, so in any case, um, uh, I will leaving this checklist up so that uh, people can, um, use this to remind themselves of any questions they might have about any of these, these elements, I will now take questions. Yes, um, so we have a proposal before the TC39 committee of um, what we call uh, delegated promises or handled promises, depending what version of the proposal. It's, it's one proposal, which has gone through several different variants. Um, but the idea is that uh, there are various, a, a promise can be thought of as an eventual designator of some target object. The promise exists now, but what object it is fulfilled to can be determined later. But um, the promise exists so that you can do things with it now that are about the thing that the promise was, will fulfill to later. Um, so the promises in JavaScript actually descend directly from the promises from my e-programming language, which were intended to both be for eventual designation and for remote designation. In order to enable, in order to recover uh, the original intention without, while still staying within the promise standard, uh, is we've proposed uh, um, uh, two things. One is some new operations to do what we call an eventual send of a message on a promise so that you can say, um, uh, 
I'll, I'll just speak the protocol, the, the, the code out loud, and hopefully it's short enough that you can. Um, if you have an object that, let's say, take, has a foo method with argument, um, with argument bar, um, uh, then uh, instead of saying object dot foo open paren bar close paren, where the dot implies synchronous, a synchronous call, instead the notation we've ended up using is capital E open paren object close paren dot foo of bar. And what that, the, the capital E is, is a pun. It, it's using the, it actually uses the proxy mechanism internally. But the meaning of it is whatever this object eventually designates and, where, and wherever that, that, that eventual target is. So it's both time and space. So it's, it's, you know, you're the promise is separated from what it's designating potentially in both time and space. Um, eventually, once, once it's known what the, problem, par, tar, what the promise designates, deliver the message foo open paren bar. Foo with, the foo is the message name, bar is the arguments. Deliver that eventually to that target object. Uh, in order to do that, Within the language, we've created this um, promise constructor, handled promise constructor pattern that's an extension of the existing promise constructor pattern, where in the existing promise constructor pattern, you already provide callbacks. You provide the resolver and the rejector. Uh, uh, in this case, you provide a handler for remote methods, essentially, so that if you're doing it to a normal promise, it just does the normal local uh, postponed delivery, but if you do it to a handled promise, it then invokes the handler, where the handler, in our case, can then be part of an implementation of the distributed object system that serializes the message, transmits it to another address space, unserializes it there, and delivers it. Uh, and we didn't want to standardize, propose for standardization, the distributed object system itself, or even the serialization system. So by simply proposing a way to create a handled promise by providing a handler, we're able to do all of the rest of it in user code. Is there a comparable pattern in other languages that you're like referencing from or, or pointing to as like this is how it works there and here's how it could fit into the ergonomics of JavaScript? So the um, uh, this way of doing distributed promises was actually in the pro the way in which I layered abstractions in my promise implementation in my E language. Uh, but also, for example, for proxies, uh, if you take the um, uh, Java has a way to do a handled implementation of an interface. So if a type is defined by interface, not a class, I forget the, the, na the names of the various pieces, but there is a, a, a part of the Java reflection API is that you can provide a generic invocation handler for an interface defined type such that to a client such that it produces an object that's like a proxy that seems to implement all of those methods and when you you call any of the methods it's then reflected into a handled method uh, invoking the handler and that's directly analogous to what we're doing in JavaScript with proxies Uh, so I don't know Ruby's method missing, yeah. but I know method missing, I know method not understood from small talk. It sounds like very much the same thing. And, uh, and one, of our, one of the reasons why we went to hit, one of our principles in doing the proxy API is that people's first inclination was to use something like a method missing in order to do this generic reflection of all unhandled methods. But the problem is that by having that itself be a method, you now have a, a confusion of abstraction levels. Um, and it's exactly this thing about the extension point looks like a public method that could be directly invoked by the clients. So it's actually sort of directly in line with the hazards of inheritance that I was showing, which is that the extension points 
are too easily confused with with API that the client is supposed to invoke. So you could override that wouldn't have been one that had been like a pair of clock. Yeah, or yeah, or yes. Yeah. Um, and by having the handler be only provided to the constructor by having the client of the object has no observable way to tell that this object has been extended by a handler. You've separated the two namespaces completely, the public interface of the handler versus the public interface of the object. 